this Friday with Melvin. Welcome to, uh, to a discussion about Larson syndrome. So today we're going to be giving a short discussion about Larson syndrome. Uh, we try to do this on Fridays occasionally, once a month or twice a month, and go over a topic. And uh, hopefully we're improving our audiovisual techniques today, and hopefully you can see me uh, live uh, or watch this on Facebook afterwards regarding Larson syndrome. So Larson syndrome is a disease that is um, associated with multiple joint dislocations, meaning that the, uh, the knees, the hips, the elbows, the wrists, the ankles, and the feet can have joints within that are not in place. Um, and there's also spinal involvement in this disease. So I, I treat a great deal of arthrogryposis, which means stiff joints, and Larson syndrome, by definition, if it has stiff joints, will be called arthrogryposis, it's a stiff-like syndrome, but it's its own unique syndrome and its own unique rare syndrome. So it's arthrogrypotic-like, it's not truly arthrogryposis or AMC. In terms of the incidence, it's about one in 100,000 individuals will have uh, Larson syndrome, which is quite rare. It's very variable in its presentation, means some people may only have lower extremities, a few joints, and some people, and some children or adults can have multiple joints involved. It is transmitted genetically as an autosomal dominant gene, which means that if someone does have this, the likelihood of their children having it is 50%. But many children who are born with, with Larson syndrome are the first in their family, and that's called a spontaneous mutation, that they're the first ones who have this disease. And the gene itself codes for something called filament D, and Many times the genetic testing may be normal because the gene defect may be very variable and different within this gene and therefore multiple testing may be required before coming out with the exact type of Larson's or the type of gene involvement that one has. And this is pretty much a, a child lying on their back um, and you can see that Actually, this looks like they're lying on their stomach. The knee is going in the reverse direction. And I'll show you, this is how they actually came out of the womb. Basically, this is the thigh, and there's the leg going backwards. It's actually 90 degrees the wrong way. Nine, instead of flexing, it extends itself 90 degrees. And one cannot just leave this. It's an eight-month-old child who cannot bend their knees. And basically, this child, as opposed to some diseases which we treat later on, should be treated pretty young uh, to try to get this reduced, to get these knee dislocations reduced, whether that begins with casting. And we'll talk about some of the treatments in a few minutes. Again, just another view showing the knees going in the wrong direction. And again, and there's the child looking from, uh, from the bottom. And again, you see the hips are out wide and the knees are reversed and the feet, and the feet are clubfoot. So again, multiple joints, dislocated joints of the feet, dislocated knees, and the hips are shallow, um, and we'll show that in the x-ray right now. So you can see the hips are shallow, or for those who don't know, that's a shallow hip, and not a dislocated hip, and these knees are fully dislocated. Now one can try casting the knees, certainly were tried at first to see if you can reduce the knees or put the knees back in the joint. Uh, if you put the knees back in the joint um, by, by uh, um, uh, casting, however, most of these uh, children will require some type of surgical intervention to treat this. And this child, at approximately six months of age, had surgery to put these knees back in the joints. But each knee is different. That is, even in the same child, when the knee is dislocated, one has to be able to treat these and get the knee reduced and put the ligaments back in different ways in, even in the same child. So one time it could be the the outside ligament could be the lateral collateral ligament, the anterior cruciate ligament, different parts of the joint can be deficient in each different knee. And this time I actually put wires across the knee to hold them stable while the child healed for the first six weeks. Unlike real arthrogryposis, Larson's doesn't often get stiff, but can get stiff. And this is after a few weeks, and after we took them off, and this cartilage is actually intact, even though it looks like the knee is going into barracks. These knees are reduced within the joint now, and the child actually can now stand. So this is before, showing a video of the, of the child before surgery. Let's see if we can get that to uh, show it to you. And there it is. And there's the child actually trying to stand up. 
well, this is actually a different job in the x-ray, but the same, you see the knee going backwards. Which the child just can't stand. And this is really only three months after surgery. And there's the child actually walking with a walker, but at least walking and will use it. And then now is actually walking without a walker. But basically, that's just one child. But we have to be careful also as the spine. The spine in Larson syndrome is very complicated and very variable. And oftentimes, this is even the, one of the children eight months of age, where you're starting to see some compression of the spine at the level of C7. And that's C7, right up before it starts into the chest, and there's this congenital kyphosis, and that can become problematic for the child, and they need to be treated very young to prevent paralysis. Here's an older child who presented to have to be treated elsewhere. This is just to show some of the problems that can happen if the child is not treated young. This is a 12 year old, oops, sorry. This is a 12 year old, and one can see this knee is now dislocated. But now we're at age 12, much different. The knee is never bent, it's been extended, it's somewhat painful for the child, patient to walk, and it's completely unstable when they do walk, and is also quite short. The other side, however, had a club foot, and in trying to treat that club foot, people who treated gave up, and because of severe nerve pain and pain, it actually amputated the leg on this side, which is often avoidable. I, I was not there for this child, but this child ended up with an amputation on the right side, which again, treated early on, it should not have to happen. And the knee, they were ready to amputate that as well, but I think that could be treated without amputation. And you can see here's the, uh, the CAT scan, just showing the knee completely dislocated, and even if it's an incongruous, somewhat incongruous joint, and I'll show that in a minute. You get a cat scan, it shows you exactly what you have to reconstruct. And just to show how complicated it become to fix this in a 12 year old, this is the number of procedures this child underwent to fix this. From reduction of the knee to shortening of the femur to decompressing or releasing the nerves to make sure they're not too tight, opening the compartments releasing the ligaments, and then reconstructing some of the other ligaments in terms of um, and lengthening the quadriceps mechanism. So this patient underwent all these different things just to hold the knee in place in a 12-year-old, which is seemingly very difficult to do. And this patient has about a zero to 60 degree range of motion. And if the knee became arthritic, at least now, it can be replaced. Put an artificial Put the knees back. And we left these hips dislocated, which probably today I would not do. I'd probably try to reduce the hips when they're very young, because they do walk better if you reduce the hips in Larson's, and when they have bilateral club feet. But you can treat the club feet by getting the foot to the ground, by working around the joints and putting the joints back in place when you can, and then actually working around the joint, working on the tibia to make the foot go on the ground. And even if you had to close this growth point so it doesn't come back again, the foot is now flat on the ground, and this patient walks quite well. Another problem that can occur is the bone can be very short. So this young girl, her biggest problem was that she had about a two inch difference between the two legs, or actually almost a three inch difference. And this knee did not bend at all, and this knee didn't bend much. And she was almost ready for an amputation at this point. But even this knee, um, while it cannot be fixed, and I'm gonna show you this. So this is, a, this, is when, this is for surgeons out there, for parents. If the knee is this flat at this age, which is again about 11 years old, then you cannot try to bend this knee in surgery. The knee will not bend. It may bend it during surgery, but afterwards it will become stiff again. So to release the mechanisms and to release all the muscles and try to get it to bend will not work. So what we did was I lengthened her bone with a rod internally, got her legs to be the same length, which they became, and then this bone heals up by itself with this device, this internal lengthening device. And then down the road, I can replace the knee with an artificial knee um, and give them motion and do the muscle releases at that time. Because this, this knee will not move if it's that flat. Flat knees do not bend. That's the lesson from today. So Larson syndrome. So just to complete the conversation about at least the lower extremity joints, each joint has to be treated differently. Each patient has to be treated differently. I think we need to understand that we can achieve good function we can achieve ambulation in almost every patient with Larson syndrome. There's no patient's why, there shouldn't be a reason why patients aren't ambulatory. In arthrogryposis or in amyoplasia, they're often missing muscles. In Larson syndrome, 
They may be weak, some of the muscles, but they're almost always all there. And that is a big difference. And then we have to have the neck evaluated early, treated early, so that be, so paralysis does not occur. So again, I think the lower extremity joints, whether it's club feet, hip, dis, hip dislocations, or knee dislocations is the most, most difficult, which is why I spent the most time talking about it. They can be treated, they can be reduced, the kids can get motion, and really live, and the adults can live active lives with pretty good joints. And if the joints need to be replaced, they can be replaced at older ages with muscles that still move. So I think that one has to approach Larson syndrome pretty aggressively from a very young age, unlike other diseases, to get the joints in place and stabilized, and then, and whether it's the feet, the hips, and the knees, and then get moving on. And we can discuss upper extremity, I think I will do AMC, um, upper extremity uh, choices for function as well as Larson syndrome at a different time when we do upper extremity discussion of elbows, um, wrists, uh, hands, both in AMC and Larson syndrome, which has some commonality. Um, so I am going to be taking questions uh, regarding Larson syndrome, um, if anybody has any. If you have questions now, I'm happy to answer any that you have, and uh, one of uh, our, my associates will be reading the question to me. If you want to, you can just write into Facebook and we'll try to review those questions um, after the weekend or over the weekend. So I wish everybody a happy, uh, a good weekend, and hopefully you had a great Valentine's Day yesterday. Um, and this is uh, Friday with Feldman signing off. So again, I'll ask any questions um, from the uh, from the group. I'm gonna wait about three minutes for those questions. Minutes, but I think we've, uh, if you have any questions, please feel free to uh, type them in. But again, I think we'll give another minute or two. Um, and then we have, um, we do have a rare disease coordinator whose name is Sarah Ziegler. That's S, -S Ziegler, Z I E G L E R, at paleoinstitute.org. And you can email her. And she is only working with these rare diseases and with Larson syndrome in general. I think we do have a question from Jeremy. Uh, Julia wants to know will you explain cartilage? So, so what about the cartilage in Larson syndrome? So I mean, it's you know cartilage is a is what lines joints. The whiteness when you eat when you have chicken, unfortunately we'll describe it from food. The white of the chicken bone in the joint is the is is the is cartilage. It lines each joint and makes it, it makes it smooth. The cartilage is is usually pretty smooth in, the, in early on in Larson syndrome. It's not necessarily a disease of cartilage. Unlike a disease like pseudoachondroplasia, which may be a disease of cartilage. But in Larson syndrome, the cartilage itself may start out normal, but because the joints are dislocated and the pressure on that cartilage, on that white topping of the joint, is so pressure filled, it will destroy the cartilage. When, it's cartilage, when cartilage becomes worn out, that is what we call arthritis. And that's what makes joints stiff as well. Okay, so thank you very much all for listening. Hopefully you enjoyed, hopefully it was informative in some way. Any suggestions, we're willing to listen up. We have one more question. Is there a higher potential for Larson's patients to develop arthritis? Yes, yeah, so the question was, is there a higher potential for Larson syndrome to develop arthritis? The answer is absolutely yes. And that's because of the fact that they have these pressure on their joints. But we think the younger we can make the joints normal, we know, the younger we can make the joints normal and align them, that the less the chance, the longer we can delay that arthritis. But for joints not to become arthritic, they need to be congruent. And that's the problem with Larson syndrome, is they're not always 